Hello, it is 26th of May 2018 and this is episode 68 of Scavengers Horde, a Star Wars podcast. I'm Rachel. And I'm Kirsty. We're here to deliver a regular rundown of Star Wars news, analysis and commentary, with a focus on the sequel trilogy and the future of the saga. This episode is going to be a special one because there isn't going to be any of the usual waffle about the news and about what we've been doing and so on and so forth. We are just going to devote this purely to a review of Solo, a Star Wars story. Um, And yeah, the format today is that we're going to start off with a general discussion that will be without spoilers. So it's fine to listen if you're just on the fence about seeing the movie and you want to know what we think about it without getting big spoilers about the plot or anything. And then we will move into an in-depth run-through of the story and that will obviously be heavily spoilerific. So you can check out before that if you have not yet seen the film. So, right, with that out of the way, I think the best place to start is just to talk a little bit about our general feelings about the movie. So, Kirsty, what did you make of it? How did you feel about Solo? I really enjoyed it. Like, Good. we've both kind of gone in with low expectations, kind of based on our general interest in this kind of story, plus all the production drama that was going on and everything. Mm. Um, and I think that was a really great way to approach it, because I was pleasantly surprised. It was yeah. a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Um and yeah, I just, I laughed a lot. I felt like there were really great emotionally deep moments. Um, I got a lot more attached to the characters than I thought I would. Yeah. Um, and I just, yeah, I thought a lot of the performances were fantastic. So yeah, can't wait to see it again. No, I felt the same. Like it was a really pleasant surprise for me. I've seen it twice now and I really enjoyed it both times. Um, I think I was especially impressed by how much I cared about the characters. Like mm-hmm. you mentioned, Kirsty, because... I really wasn't expecting to feel much investment, especially in the new characters, because I think I felt a bit burned by Rogue One, maybe, Mm -hmm. because that movie's fun and I enjoyed it, but none of the characters in that movie really stayed with me. I didn't come out thinking about Gian Erso or Cassian Andor or like any of the other characters in that movie. They were kind of like one and done deals for me, whereas there's characters in Solo who I am really interested in them. So like today I went out and I made a special trip to the center of the city purely to buy Most Wanted, which is the prequel novel about Kira and Han, just because I really liked Kira and I wanted to know more about her and how she came to be in her situation. So it was really important to me that I rush out and get that book. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that to me is a great sign of the movie working because I cared and I wanted to know more. So that corporate synergy came into (laughs) effect very nicely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that book too. I've heard some good things. Um, Yeah, I felt it was very different from Rogue One as well. I I, I guess it's inevitable we're going to compare it to the other existing standalone, um, just because that's how it is with a franchise like this. Um, It felt like polar opposite to me because Rogue One is like this big epic story that's very plot-driven, Mm. and moves very fast and the characters are kind of built around the story that they want to tell like yes. it seemed like with Rogue One the premise was that starting point with the Death Star and the plans and how the rebels got them whereas Solo's the reverse almost like you have this much smaller scale story it doesn't feel epic around this character and yeah. these relationships that he has with people around him yeah. um, and as a result yeah we felt more attached to those characters because it was the emphasis was on their arcs yeah and the story was almost afterthought Um, yeah because of that i didn't feel that much tension with some of the things that were going on in the story but that was okay because they were there as a means to an end like it was about how they were going to affect han's development and kira's development and even characters like beckett um who had more depth than i thought he was going to have yeah, I really thought that Beckett was going to be a super insignificant character, actually. Like, maybe a few key scenes, but he was way more important than I thought. So, yeah, that was a nice surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like you said, I think the film did sometimes suffer from being very, very low stakes. But you're also right in saying that that was very much by design. Um, because, yeah, it's a movie where you're not meant to be focusing on the plot too much and that is entirely secondary it's about the journey not the destination (laughs) to use a cliche (laughs) but i do think that's very true for this movie and 
yeah like i liked that and it's kind of a situation where i think that rogue one probably did work better as a movie and i think it was more polished and better put together i can't help but think that i prefer solo like even though it's somewhat messy and very flawed in certain ways just because i cared much much more than i did in rogue one yeah i think i'm in the same boat there like it just it kind of depends on what your primary area of interest is in star wars right yeah and we just tend to be more about the characters and that side of the development as opposed to plot um yes. so yeah with rogue one i sorry to keep bringing rogue one up <laughs> this is about <laughs> solo but just for comparison's sake i haven't felt this burning need to revisit rogue one much yeah. i think i've watched it once since the blu-ray came out mm-hmm. um and i might watch it now again to kind of affirm like how i feel about it versus solo yeah but right now i'm feeling like solo is just my kind of standalone comparatively because um i like that it's this smaller scale thing um and i i know that that won't be to every star wars fan's taste because we're so used to star wars being this huge epic thing yeah right it's got this real operatic feel and solo doesn't feel like that but i like that um they're taking it in different directions and showing that you can have movies in this universe that tell very different kinds of stories. Yeah. Um, And that's why I find some of the reactions quite interesting. We kind of knew that this was going to happen after The Last Jedi. People were criticizing it for taking too many risks and being too subversive. Mm. And now people are saying that Solo is too safe. (laughs) But I think for that reason, Solo did take risks because it is a risk to show this kind of smaller story can be told. Because it's not what people primarily think of when they think of Star Wars. Yeah, no, that's really true. And I find this movie quite bold in a way. It shows that there's no real interest in Lucasfilm in following a formula. Mm -hmm. So even though Rogue One and Solo, they're both under the Star Wars story label, they're both very different films. And I think that's like very healthy from a creative point of view, because... I think it just gets boring when you follow a template, you know? So I kind of have that problem with Marvel sometimes. It's like all of their, like, superhero origin movies, they do tend to, like, hit the same beats in terms of, like, getting their character to their destination. And I think they then do mix things up more. But often there is, like, a formula. And I was not watching Solo and being aware of, like, any kind of formula to it, you know? Like, it felt very episodic and... Yeah, it wasn't like a single epic mission like Rogue One was. It was just about this one guy and some stuff he goes through. Like mm-hmm. his fun escapades. It was refreshing. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Did you um, pick up on the director change or the behind the scenes turmoil at all while watching it? Or were you able to put that out of your mind quite well? I put it out of my mind because I honestly couldn't tell what was Ron Howard and what wasn't. Um, yeah. It felt like a Ron Howard movie to me, which I'm not like, oh, wow, I really love love Ron Howard. I mm. When we got the, the news about the change, I was like, oh, okay, that sounds quite safe and reliable because he does things pretty by the numbers, in my opinion. Mm. Um, and that's how it comes across in the movie. It was very different from Ryan Johnson's directorial style for The Last Jedi, yes. which is quite, it's quite idiosyncratic. Like, I feel like that is his movie. Yeah. Um, whereas this, it felt like Ron Howard was doing a job, and he did it serviceable. He did it well. Yeah. It's not like a bad thing. It's just it was. It wasn't like, oh wow, that's a really interesting choice by the director. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, um, I know exactly what you mean. I think for me with Solo, like the main things that drag it down are like the technical aspects, like because I do think that it's a solid script, great characters, like fun dialogue, good performances. I think all those areas are great, but it's in things like the direction, which I found very pedestrian and a bit dull sometimes, and especially the cinematography, (laughs) that I really had serious problems with it, because I just don't think that the style of cinematography worked for the movie at all, because the movie is like a fun, light-hearted adventure, and the movie is just shot in such a dark, dingy way. I know that's partially because of the settings that are chosen. So, like, Corellia is, like, this smoggy industrial planet. So, yeah, it looks smoggy and industrial, as you'd expect. And then Mimban is, like, this mud planet. And, yeah, so it's not like you have the beach planet, <laughs> <laughs> like, complete with, like, rainbows and everything. 
Um, but still, like, I think it could have been executed better to really make things pop more because sometimes I really was like even having difficulty picking out the main characters' faces on the screen. Mm. And I think that's a big problem. And yeah, it did impact my enjoyment. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I kind of understand why they did that because it's supposed to reflect this grim, dark, gritty underworld, right? That distinguishes Mm -hmm. it from the high operatic fantasy world that we know from Star Wars. And it was it was kind of similar to Rogue One in a way. Well, in terms of certain planets for Rogue One. Obviously Scarif mm. is different. Um, but yeah, I'm with you that it didn't quite reflect what ended up being the tone of the movie, which is pretty lighthearted and jovial. Yeah, It's obviously like this darkness to it, especially at the beginning when they're like, you know, this starts out with Han's early life being in this horrible, unpleasant environment. But the actual tone of what goes on, there's so much humour, there's love. Like, the actual story is pretty upbeat and, I, I don't know, I, it just didn't quite fit. But I'm I'm not an expert on things like cinematography, so I feel like I almost shouldn't really have a strong opinion on that. Yeah, like, I'm no expert at all when it comes to, like, the technical aspects of filmmaking. And I know for a fact that the cinematographer is very talented He's done like other movies that have been photographed beautifully. I- I'm struggling to think of them off the top of my head. But I Arrival, has... I thought, was a beautiful movie. Yes, Arrival. Arrival looked absolutely stunning. And I-, I do need to say that there are certain shots and moments in Solo that do look really beautiful. I thought a lot of the way the Falcon was shot was really beautiful. Like A lot of the action sequences and the races and stuff. Like, yes. It looked great, but that, like you said before, some of it is just a little too dark and it's hard to identify who who's in the scene and i think that is by design but it just didn't quite work yeah like you know like lando's introduction it makes sense for that to be dark and dingy and atmospheric but in terms of how it actually comes across on screen it's just a little too much yes in our opinion because <laughs> I've, I've i've seen other people absolutely raving about the cinematography so i feel like it's going to be one of these things that people feel very differently about and that's totally cool yeah exactly it's an eye of the beholder type thing um yeah so then just to sum up like would we both recommend this movie i think we would oh yeah i'm looking forward to seeing it again i'm hoping to go sometime this weekend yeah no i would definitely recommend it it's like a really fun movie like i wouldn't say it's like a super essential Star Wars movie because like if you miss out on a saga movie i think you feel like you're missing out on this like essential like pop culture conversation you know, because those movies feel like they have big ramifications for the galaxy. And I don't think this movie offers that. But if you just want a fun, good time at the movies, then yeah, absolutely. It's well worth your time. Yeah. And I feel like it's a really, I think it does such a great job with the character of Han. Like I was already a Han Solo fan, but I feel like even if you're not, even if he's like far from your favorite character in the saga, Mm. I feel like this could endear you to him or endear him to you, I should say. Um, more than you might expect because yes. i feel like alden does such a fantastic job yeah no that's really true and i probably didn't stress that enough myself because yeah i think that was one of the main concerns before the movie how was alden going to do in this iconic role because obviously everyone associates it so strongly with harrison ford it's like how can anyone else come in and take this over but i think he did fantastically well and he evoked Han Solo without ever doing like a copycat performance or mimicking him like it did feel like his own take but it was still recognizable as the character we're familiar with so yeah it was very welcome it's very impressive that he managed to walk that line because mm. that's it we've been talking about it for almost years now right like the fandom has been debating this idea and some people have when it was announced that he was cast some people were really not very happy about it. They didn't think it was the right choice. Yeah. So I would love to think that those people will say or are thinking, wow, I was I was wrong. He really proved me wrong. He did a great job. Yeah. Um, because he really did make the character his own. I wasn't sat there thinking, this should be Harrison Ford. He doesn't look enough like Han. Yeah. Um, because it was his own take on it. And I feel like that's fantastic because going forward this franchise is going to have to recast a lot of people who have been played already by existing characters if they want to do stories that are set earlier on in these people's lives that's kind of what you have to do 
Yeah. And I think they showed that it can be possible and you just have this different spin on it. It's like a James Bond kind of thing almost, right? Yeah. Like you have these archetypal characters and then here's a different take, but it's still recognizable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes without saying that Donald Glover was fantastic as Lando. Oh yeah, he really was. Yeah. No, so charismatic, so fun. Like there's some great specific moments as well that we'll go into in the spoiler review. Um, but yeah, like just the grin, the voice is all perfect. Yeah, I felt like his his take was a little closer to Billy D's like the intonation and the cadence of his speaking. Yes. It was pretty close to what you could consider an impression, but it was so well done that it didn't feel cheesy that way. Yeah. No, I think it felt like effortless. Yeah. Which is the difference. Because I think an impression always feels a bit strained and artificial. Whereas Donald Glover really took ownership of it and made it feel natural. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just before we go into spoilers, I just want to, as a general comment, say that I was actually really impressed by Amelia Clark because I, I, I like her. I'm a Game of Thrones fan and I do really like her as Daenerys. But I've never really seen her in anything else where she's impressed me. But she really did impress me in Solo, to be honest. And I think Kira is quite a difficult role because she's a very mysterious, enigmatic character. But I think Clark actually brought quite a lot of depth and nuance to it, which I really appreciated. Yeah, the, the first, the early scenes between her and Han, I was a little bit worried. Mm. Um, but I think that was just me taking a while to get into it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the early dialogue was also a bit rough, to be honest. I think that might have been it. I think it might have been more about the writing. Because it yeah. was... And to an extent, you're just going to get that with Star Wars, where they have these, like, very standard fairy tale origins of like people growing up in these circumstances and having to it, it's essentially for kids right that's why i have to yeah. remind myself <laughs> sometimes it's going to be a bit simplistic and on the nose and yes that can feel a little corny sometimes but yeah. it was okay like it ended up that was just where they had to start and then they evolved from there and it was fine yeah exactly he improved as it went along um right so i think we both recommend the movie um <laughs> and if you have not yet seen it we would strongly recommend that you rush out and do so before listening to our spoiler review <laughs> right so i think it's time to get into the nitty-gritty with this movie and yeah we're basically going to go through it chronologically i'm sure there will be some jumping around because that's the nature of a conversation you can't stick too closely to a plan but we do have a plan and that plan is the plot of the movie <laughs> so and please remember i've only seen it once and rachel's only seen it twice so there might be little details that we just misremember and get wrong yes uh, we're just going to do our best yeah we definitely do not have photographic memories <laughs> <laughs> Although that's what we always aspire to. <laughs> yeah, there were there were so many Easter eggs and little references to things in like legends and canon in terms of like the, the cartoons and books and all sorts that I'm sure there are a million things that we're going to miss and just forget to bring up. Yes. Um, and stuff that we might not have even caught because our emphasis on fandom tends to be on the films and some of the newer books but we're not experts in legends and things like Clone Wars yes. so just excuse us if we don't bring up every single thing <laughs> yeah no exactly so and, and there is a lot to cover in this movie to be honest so we're probably gonna have to stick to the broad strokes rather than the little things like that for the most part though I'm sure we'll bring up some mentions and stuff mm-hmm um, right, so the movie obviously starts out on Corellia when Han and Kira are madly in love. <laughs> and yeah, so basically um, Han screws something up and he has to escape this gang that he and Kira have been hanging with. And so they hop into a speeder and they race off and they try to get a transport off world. But it goes wrong and Han and Kira are separated. And at that point, Han signs up for the Imperial Navy, while Kira is consigned to some unknowable and presumably unpleasant fate at the hands of the gang that she was trying to leave behind. So, yeah, what did you make of this first part of the movie, Kirsty? What sort of note did you feel it struck? I thought it was very endearing. Um, kind of questionable in terms of, like we said before, the dialogue and then that kind of had a knock-on effect to how some of the their performance felt a little forced yes um but in that way that it was like oh i recognize what they're trying to do here they're like almost in 
these 80s style outfits and they have their bigger hair and it was like <laughs> a, a quick look at their teenage years where they're like yeah like you say like madly in love and it's like this bonnie and clyde we need to get out of here um scum rat i think they're called in the is that what they call them yeah it is yeah it's it's just very cute and you could feel even though you knew what was going to happen you knew that they were going to get separated uh it felt very tense like as they were going through um trying to get through that gate it was like oh god yeah (laughs) you know what's going to happen but it's horrible yeah I i actually knew the film was working for me when han and kira were separated and i really felt it yeah. Like, I think it was really well done how they portrayed, like, the horror of being separated in that moment. Um, and they also did it in a very Star Wars way because Han is obviously extremely distraught about it. But he kind of, like, bucks up and he then goes off to sign up for the Imperial Navy because that's what characters do in Star Wars, even if they've been mm-hmm. through traumatic stuff. They're like, right, I still need to go and do this so I can then achieve this. Because in Han's case, he doesn't just sign up to the imperial navy for the hell of it he does it because he wants to find a way to get back and help kira and he knows he Mm -hmm. can only do that if he makes something of himself yeah it had this real practical feel to it that like you say kind of evokes leia and alderaan and even ray um we're going to talk about a lot of the parallels that we notice between han and ray in this story Mm. um but yeah it just really came through that he was like obviously devastated when it happened and then immediately, like, okay, I have to figure out a plan. And then this is the course that my life's going to take. This is my singular goal now. Yeah, exactly. And he, and he does it in, like, quite a cheerful, nonchalant way. And I think Alden did a good job of playing it because he didn't play it in a way that suggested he didn't care. He just played it in a way that suggested he's, like, quite a cheerful, persistent person. Like, and he just really wants to, like, persevere with this because he's so dead set on his goal of helping Kira. And, yeah, like, he's he channels his, like, grief and his sadness into something constructive, which is, yeah, the ultimate Star Wars thing. Yeah, that really did remind me of Rey because we know that she has this very private goal that she hasn't really shared with anyone around her that she wants to be reunited with her family Mm. and she has this brave face as she goes about her day-to-day business with that goal Mm. um and you see that with han right that he's like okay my goal is to be reunited with this person that i love i have to get back to corellia you know i have to get back to jakku yeah um but it yeah there belies this like this trauma underneath yeah there's yeah no that's really well observed and yeah, like it was interesting seeing the gang that um, Kira and Han were like stuck in with. It's like Lady Proxima's gang, I think. Mm-hmm. And all the way all the kids in that gang were dressed, it reminded me so, so strongly of Rey on Jakku and the other scavengers. And I really do think they're building up this kind of like wider world building of this like poverty and exploitation and corruption. Like, so I do think you had like a sense of the corruption in the original trilogy and more so in the prequels because there's all thoughts of like trade syndicates and how they're betraying each other and like taking backhand deals and stuff. So it's always been part of Star Wars. But I think the sequel trilogies thing in particular is very much about children and how children are commodified and exploited and treated as possessions by their masters. And I think we're seeing that again and again because you have Kira and Han with Lady Proxima, you have Rey with Uncar Plutt, you have Jin who's basically made into a child soldier by Saw Gerrera. <laughs> um, and then you have the kids on Canto Bight, you have Finn and the Stormtroopers with the First Order. It just goes on and on. In every facet of this galaxy there's this exploitation and commodification of life. And I, I can't help but think they might be building that to something more. And I'd be very interested to see how they would touch upon that in episode nine if they choose to do so. Yeah, it feels like this natural kind of Dickensian archetype to go with, right? Like this whole Oliver Twist thing. Yeah. Um, and that really did remind me of Ray with like the comparisons between Unkar and Lady Proxima. Obviously, someone like Saul Guerrero is a bit more benevolent in terms of wanting to care for someone. Yeah. But they still have a larger goal and kind of uh, indoctrinate people or children into what their goal and perspective is. Yeah. And they still, um, like, use them. 
like in yeah. a way that that child probably would not have chosen to be used if they had had a yeah it's like choice. stolen childhoods basically isn't it that yeah these kids do not get to live carefree lives as kids yeah it's like the opposite of luke who does seem to have had like a very happy and carefree childhood yeah yeah no it's really interesting and yeah it really made me feel for them like and it was it's probably a bit of a cheap trick to like earn empathy from the audience but it was effective well, that's the thing, isn't it? These things work, and that's why we see them over and over again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's amusing to me, though, that literally every single new Star Wars movie, we are getting that as, like, a trope. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see how they, like, wing that with um, Boba Fett. I'm sure they will. <laughs> well, I mean, he does have that to an extent, right? It's a, the whole clone thing, and with his father tragically dying at the hands yeah, of them that's true i guess boba in canon he's like a literal commodity because he was given his payment wasn't he to Django fett yeah i honestly oh, i know we're getting sidetracked now but i i don't hate the idea of a boba fett movie as much as other people seem to yeah i feel like there is fertile ground there i feel like they could do a good job i'm interested because james mangold's doing it but um yeah we'll have a full discussion about that next week um one thing that really interested me at this point when Han's like through the gate and figuring out like do I want to join the Empire is that when he looks over and sees that propaganda there like people trying to recruit him Mm -hmm. you can hear in universe the Imperial March that kind of blew my mind a little bit yeah I didn't actually notice that the first time I saw it I think maybe I just took it so for granted that it was going to be like just overlaid music that I didn't even realize it was being played within the context of the movie I think I was yeah. more aware of it when I saw it the second time, so I think I'd read someone pointing that out. It is quite crazy, like, to think about. It feels very meta. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, wait, is this playing as Darth Vader walks around? <laughs> like, is someone scurrying behind him with a boombox? <laughs> yes. I, I don't know, it just had really funny implications. Obviously, we're not supposed to take it literally, we're not supposed to think about it that much, but it's just funny to do so, because I was just like, oh, wow. They're actually playing this as part of the official Empire propaganda. Like, I just found it so funny. It is funny. I guess it is a pretty sweet piece of music, so it makes it's sense why they want to use it. <laughs> yeah, sign me up. <laughs> um, you have a really good point here, Kirsty, about expecting parallels between Han and Ben. Yeah, so we talked before, because we know we're big Han Solo fans, we're big Ben Solo fans, and... We just kind of wondered before we watched the movie whether there were going to be any father and son parallels. And I think there are a couple, Mm. um, maybe quite subtle and in terms of like, they're just overall understanding of the characters and underlying motivations for things. But if anything, and I think you agree with me, um, I felt like there were greater parallels between Han and Rey and then Kira and Ben. Yeah. In terms of how those characters related to each other. I would agree with that. Um, yeah, I just felt like we've talked a little before about the parallels between Han and Rey. And even when we watched The Force Awakens, I felt like this was a clear understanding that the reason Han became kind of attached to Rey and her to him is that you felt like there was this common ground in terms of them both having these tough upbringings and him seeing something in her and inviting her to work with him on the falcon like there was an emotional component to that yes um and yeah we've said before like it just felt like han being desperate to get back to corellia and by extension kira that's ray wanting to be reunited with her family and then coming to realize through the story and through her interactions with someone else and han through him being reunited with Kira and Mm. then not quite realizing until it's too late that she is already gone in some way yeah that they're no longer the people they were and can't be because of horrible things that have happened to her that are only vaguely alluded to yeah um it's like he has idealized her in his mind not accepting that they've grown apart and they've got older and things have happened um just the way that Ray has idealized her family yeah exactly it's actually quite poignant when you think about it because to jump ahead briefly like even at the very end of the film i get the impression that han doesn't truly realize like that he's lost kira even at the very end 
like and i think there's something tragic in that because he does kind of have the whole keep smiling attitude of ray to an extent and i sense that if solo's a success there would have been more films that would have been about following the progress of that relationship and the disillusionment like as they learn more about each other and what's happened in the interim during the separation yeah I know we'll talk about it later because we're going through it chronologically, but I do feel like that ending with Kira's choice was handled really well because there is this ambiguity to it from her end and from his end as he watches the ship sail away. It's like, he obviously his heart is breaking in that moment. He's looking up and he has puppy dog eyes and Chewie's there kind of comforting him. But you don't. it's not clear if he understands why she would make that choice. He doesn't know where she's going. Yeah. He doesn't know who to. Um, because at that point, she's, from my understanding, she's kind of protecting him from all of that. Yeah. Um, that was my view of that, it as well. Yeah, the idea. Yeah, she's t- saying everyone's dead. It's just me. Um, it means that Han can go on and live the life that we end up seeing in the original trilogy. And he does find that happiness with Leia. Yeah. So she like releases him for his own good to an extent. Yeah. And th- coming back to the parallels between kylo and kira it's almost kind of on the nose and i don't know if everyone picked up on this but like we have them talking in the elevator before they go in and see this final boss then it looks like she's gonna kill han but ends up killing this master to all intents and purposes someone she feels like she's indebted to and then she takes up that mantle yeah even though she has feelings for this other person yeah i mean I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but that seemed what it was like for me. Yeah. No, no, I I definitely think that's what's going on. And yeah, it works so well because it's that tragic romance. And also at this point, just because like in this early part, we do see that love connection with Kieran Hahn. I just want to say I was really surprised and pleasantly so by just how like sexy this movie was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Finally. much snogging, Kirsty. He was like, oh, Some scandalous. good food. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I was pleasantly surprised. I know that The Force Awakens was, I think, criticised in some quarters for being really sexless. But it seems like they've been like, ramping up every single movie since. So with Rogue One, you had all the sexual tension with Jin and Cassian. Then with Last Jedi, enough said. And then with Rogue One, people literally can't get their hands off each other. <laughs> so at this rate, we might yeah. be getting a sex scene by episode nine. Who knows? <laughs> For obvious reasons, I don't agree that The Force Awakens was sexless, but I agree that it was subtextual. You yes. Know? Um, but this was like, oh, they're talking about fucking right there. <laughs> like they're talking about having sex on the Falcon. There's a shot of the bed. Like... Yeah, I don't know how much more brazen they can get in a movie that children are watching. Yeah, it was very bold. So, Let's put it that yeah. way. I liked that. Yeah, no, I really appreciated it. Right, so then the next part of the movie, we see Han as an Imperial recruit working as a mud trooper, which looks pretty damn miserable. Um, then he kind of runs into Beckett, Val and Rio, who are trying to steal a piece of equipment to do a job. And yeah, then for a series of hijinks, Han meets Chewie. And then both of them get pulled into this train heist with Beckett and his crew. And yeah, during the course of that train heist, sadly, we lose the characters we have only just met. Those characters being Val and Rio, because there's a bit of a tussle between Beckett's crew and Enfys Nest and the Marauders. So yeah, how did this part work for you, Germany, Kirsty? I really liked it and I grew quite attached to those characters even though we lost them pretty early on. Yes. Um, I felt like there was so much potential there, especially with Val and we'll get to it, but I've just, I should have seen it coming, but I am just bummed that yet again there's like fridging of female characters for the man pain. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't even much man pain, let's be honest here. <laughs> it was very, very It was brief. like, yeah, the stuff with Beckett, I thought it was handled well um again in the star warsy way where it's like oh i'm really bummed oh well moving on yes but um i thought that their relationship as we saw it was handled really well Mm. um i thought it was really touching to see them together and and i think tandy newton has said in interviews that they're very yin and yang and i felt like that came across yeah um 
that they had this partnership that was very business focused as well as the romantic component yeah no that makes sense like um i I did buy them as having worked together for a long long time and like being lovers so i thought it was sold well and like you say yeah i kind of feel like we got just enough of val and rio to really care about them and then when they die you're kind of like bummed out and it's a bit like oh man really like especially val i liked how cynical she was (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if it was just me not following the action part of the story enough, but I was like, does she really have to die at this point? Mm. Like, she was just like, oh, yeah, it's been great. I wouldn't change a thing. And then opts to kill herself and save that. But it's just like, it, was that really what had to happen? Yeah, that was really unclear to me, to be honest. Her motives exactly for doing that. I'm sure mm. that there is a justification slash explanation in the context of the movie, but it wasn't really coming across to me. And yeah, it was a bit frustrating because she has, is such a cool character. And come on, it's Fandy Newton. Of course, you want to see more Fandy Newton. <laughs> exactly. She was fantastic, but it was just like, oh, I just wish we'd got a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, frustration. <laughs> like, I, I liked the idea of the train heist, and I think it was handled technically well. I just thought it maybe went on a little bit too much, but that's just my bias for I'm not a huge fan of extended action scenes. Yes. Yeah, no, I would just, agree I just with find that. it hard to follow them. Yeah, like, it is not where my interest lies. So if I could sacrifice, like, five minutes from that train chase to have more, like, character development, more time with Val, more time with Kira, I would 100% take that time. Mm. Um, and I-, I thought it was done fine as an action scene, but it wasn't particularly exciting to me. Scenes like that, I think, underlined where the direction fell a bit short. Because I think with exceptional direction, you could make that sequence absolutely incredible and completely engrossing. And yeah, as I've said, it was just fine. (laughs) Yeah, like I enjoyed it, but I, yeah, I just, I'm with you. It's like, okay, I get the point. Uh, And then you see how other characters later on are like, they could have maybe had one or two extra scenes and character moments that would have just added more depth and... It's all in terms of they have to please a lot of different people with different interests for these kind of films, so I just have to let it go. Yeah, exactly. And there are going to be people out there who, for them, those scenes are like a real highlight and they're going to love it. Exactly. And that's awesome. And I celebrate that. It's just not where where the main interest lies for me. Um, What did you think about how Han and Chewie meet? I I really did like that Chewie was pitted as this kind of like fearsome monster, like the Rancor or something. Um, and then obviously it's just Chewie and you're like yay this is so much fun I said to my husband like oh my god is this going to be Chewie in there mm. like that would because it, but it wasn't what I was expecting going in in terms of how they would meet yes. so it was a real pleasant surprise because it was like oh cool <laughs> like it just made it more interesting to me uh, I hadn't really thought too much about what their meeting would actually look like but it wasn't that yeah um, and it was just like so funny that It was like, oh, don't worry, I can speak your language. We can figure this out together. And what a great way for that friendship to begin. Yeah. No, it was really cool. And it also, again, reminded me of the parallels between Han and Rey. Because um, Rey can understand Wookiee. And Mm. I was like, oh, you're so similar. (laughs) No wonder Han saw himself in you, Rey. (laughs) Yeah. And just the cute details of, like, giving Han subtitles, but not Chewie, because obviously we never get subtitles for Chewie, but you're then given that humorous one-sided conversation again. Yes. <laughs> I just thought it was handled so well, and the way, like, <laughs> they only show his feet as he's coming towards him. Yes. But at that point, obviously, the audience is supposed to twig who it is. Yeah, of course, yeah. And I did also and... like the way those two Imperials were, like, watching him and, like, providing, like, a live commentary. That tickled yeah. me. <laughs> That felt very Shakespearean to me. Like, you just have these onlookers with their little side, yeah, dialogue. It was just... Yeah. Yeah. I want to see their Star Wars story. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, and obviously, during the train heist, we also get introduced to Enfys Nest for the first time. And the Cloud Riders, I believe they are known as. And... Yeah, what did you make of that first appearance without going too much into the future? Because we'll cover that. I really liked it. Um, I liked how they were obviously trying to get the audience to assume that she was male with the mask, um, the the artificial voice and everything. And yeah. just the way she's presented, 
um, with that costume and made to look bigger than this teenage girl. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like that's that was handled quite well. We'd obviously speculated beforehand that she was going to turn out female. Like, I, I can't remember if we thought that before the spoilers started coming out or... Um, I, I think we did just... long before. Yeah, there was a heavy speculation okay. perpetuated by yours truly that she might be Kira. <laughs> um, but that obviously didn't happen. Well, because there was such a mystery around it. I remember we were saying, like, even if it turns out that she's not Kira, there's obviously still supposed to be a mystery around her identity. And for that reason, she's probably going to end up being a she. Yes. Because they're kind of playing on that gendered idea. Um, yeah, I just thought it was a great introduction. And I especially liked the music that they used to introduce her in the Marauders. Yes. Because I really felt like it was foreshadowing, wait a minute, is this really a villain? Because this music is not villainous at all. Yeah, no, no, it really wasn't. It was like choral music, wasn't it? And it almost sounded like children singing. Exactly, yeah. I just felt like it It really gave you this um, incongruous feel. It was like, wait a minute, this doesn't feel like people we don't want showing up. And I guess they were villains from their perspective, but I, I, that was something that we kind of anticipated in the movie because at this point, Han is... He's his own hero of his own journey, but he's not... If you think about the like, what who turn out to be rebels as antagonists, it's mm. interesting and kind of muddying the waters of what we think of as Star Wars, like yeah. good versus bad. Because yeah, no, at this point, true. he, well, he's he's not an imperial, but he's also rejecting the idea of becoming a rebel. Yeah. Uh, no, it's super interesting, and yeah, you're right that it raises interesting questions about perspective, because. Yeah, I expect the rebels are going to be a fawn in the side of certain like smugglers and ne'er do wells, because they're going to want all the resources and stuff to go to their cause. So yeah, it's going to be a problem for them. Mm-hmm. Right, I think we've covered that part of the movie adequately. Um, <laughs> the next part involves Beckett taking Han and Chewie to go and see Dryden Voss, not Quinlan Voss. <laughs> 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 we can avoid that this time. Who knows? Quinlan Voss could turn up in a movie at this point. Yeah, he could be the big bad. All the prequel stuff is back on the table. Oh my so. god. <laughs> Anything is possible. We're going to get Count Dooku back next. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically they go to see Dryden Voss on his yacht and they encounter who else but Kira herself which is exciting. And so Kira hooks them up with Lando and Lando's droid L3. And then they all team up to go on the castle run together. So a lot of stuff happens, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a busy sequence. And yeah, I guess I'll start off with a question about the villain. What did you make of Dryden Voss? I liked him. I mean, I I like Paul Bettany in basically everything. He always does a fantastic job. And I feel like he really filled that role well, that he's not like a tragic, tortured villain. He's very much like, yep, this is what I'm about. I'm a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really liked him. He was like utterly despicable, really, really evil. (laughs) And I hated him hardcore. Um, But that's a good thing because you can't be all like, oh, about every villain. You know, I don't need every movie to have a Kylo Ren equivalent. And Voss is absolutely not that. He's a scumbag, basically. And I I really like the performance as well. So I think Bethany played him as being almost super insecure, which I felt Mm. was like an interesting choice. He's obviously this hugely important gangster with like this immense wealth, this immense power. But he does seem like oddly like weak around Kira and it seems like he's beholden to her and like he uses her as a crutch sometimes. And so I think at the very end, like when there's a confrontation between Kira and Voss, she literally tells him I'm your weakness. And that's kind of how she triumphs over him by exploiting the weakness. She's again, another Mm -hmm. Kylo parallel (laughs) Mm -hmm. going on with Kira. Yeah. You very quickly get the sense with Voss that, He's the big bad in terms of like Han's story, but you can tell that he answers to people just as they do, right? That yeah. it's this machine and they're all trapped to an extent. Yeah. He comes across as like panicked that things aren't going well and he's like trying to 
lay out these threats and like, okay, well, just so you know, if this doesn't work out, I have to kill you. But that's because he answers to someone else. Yeah, exactly. There's um a chain of command. It's interesting, really, because it's like, where where is the very, very, very top? Because, yeah, we obviously see Maul at the end, but is there anyone above him? Where, like, how far <laughs> does this go, man? <laughs> yeah. Well, in terms of, like, how Maul relates to the Empire and everything, obviously he's playing this long game of trying to get back at Palpatine for betraying and abandoning him, right? Yes. Um, But you don't know at this point in the story who he's in league with. Like, with the Crimson Dawn thing is still obviously very mysterious. Yeah. No, it's very obscure. Um, I really like the um, yachts that belong to Voss. Yeah. Like, as an environment, that was super cool. And I love the singer and her little companion yeah, too. thing. That was so yes. awesome. And it was super Star Wars as well. <laughs> yeah, I think her companion singer was my new favourite background character. <laughs> <laughs> that was just really funny. I want his Star Wars story. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would totally see there being like an Avengers movie... Like, but with all the musicians from Star Wars. So you'd have that, like, duo from Solo. You'd have um, Snice Noodles and the Max Rebo band from Return of the Jedi. And uh-huh. you'd have the guys in the cantina and A New Hope and so on and so forth, you know? You could, it would be awesome. That'd make beautiful music. I'm so together. down. Yeah. But I want a Master Code Breaker Star Wars story, so I'm probably not the right person to <laughs> comment on those kind of things. <laughs> I would watch that. <laughs> yeah who wouldn't honestly yeah exactly what kind of monsters? um <laughs> so yeah i loved han's face when he saw kira again like it was complete love struck oh my god i've been trying to do everything to get back to you and you're right here in front of me looking beautiful yes um but i also loved the way he re- interacted with dryden Voss at that point because mm. he just so recognized the old hand that we know and love, right? That he's trying to talk his way out of everything, even though he doesn't really know what he's saying. Yes. It was really played for comedic effect. Oh, definitely. I thought that was done really well. And I kind of feel like they even amped it up because he's young. And yeah. it's kind of like, he's this boy, basically, and he's trying to play with the grown-ups table. And mm-hmm. he's in no way capable of doing so at this point. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was quite cute that. how <laughs> how Kira was like looking at him when he was saying these things. And it was almost like with a... Oh yeah, kind of <laughs> she, a little bit embarrassed for him, but yeah. also like trying to protect him. She looked like she was gritting her teeth at certain points, like oh, this is painful to witness. Yeah, I think this scene, um, when Kira is first reintroduced to Han, I think that's where they first really drive home like how enigmatic and mysterious she is. Um, because when we first see Kira with Han when they're teenagers on Corellia. Like, there's not that much mystery. She's basically just Han's girlfriend and they're trying to escape together. Um, But then in this scene, like on Voss's yacht, it becomes evident that lots of stuff has happened to her in the interim. And yeah, we never fully find out what that was. But like, it's implied to be really dark and troubling. And I really like found the performance very effective because Mm -hmm. I think... Clark did a great job of selling it as being like too much has happened since I last saw you Han and I'm not the person you remember me to be and again I've kind of felt it evoked that scene in The Last Jedi where Kylo kind of admits that yeah I'm a monster yes I am like Mm -hmm. and it's less intense than that it's more quiet and sad rather than like angry and bitter which is what Kylo is in The Last Jedi I think there's that similar thread of a character that the other person wants to see the best in, like feeling a lot of self-loathing and a lot of regret and a lot of shame over the things that are in their past and they just can't get over that. Yeah, I think this was really well done because I I think they made a great decision in terms of leaving that stuff ambiguous, Mm. like what exactly had been happening because to me it's coded certain ways um we've talked about it i don't know how explicit we want to be here in terms of our reading of it i think we can um, go into it to be honest it's a, it's a theory and like we're obviously not going to go explicit explicit but you you kind of get the impression that she might have been a sex worker or been like trafficked into sex work like after like she was captured by her gang like after the opening sequence i feel like that's how it's coded and how we talk about 
I mean, I think this is kind of what we were getting at even before the movie when we would see those stills of her and Voss together. Yes. There's just this element to their dynamic where she has this weird hold over him, but because there's this element of their dynamic that's presumably sexual, mm. it it has those undertones, right? Yeah. Um, And when later she's talking when they're in Lando's closet on the Falcon, she's basically saying to Han, and to me, you can... You can kind of look at this as problematic on the parts of the the writers because it's being written by men, but she kind of says, "I'm damaged goods. You don't want me. Yeah, you shouldn't want me. Yeah, and it's really, really sad. It's really tragic, and yeah, it makes me like want to reach out and say it's all gonna be okay, Kira. <laughs> um, yeah, like, and I felt it was kind of. I, I was impressed that they even like alluded to it and it is extremely subtextual and it's extremely subtextual subtext nothing covert is stated at all but like I think it's clear that she's property you know that mark on her wrist mm-hmm. that looked to me like the, the brand of ownership you know it didn't look like something that she had voluntarily entered into it was something that had been forced upon her and I think that DeVos, she is like this prized possession rather than like an autonomous person. She's an, she's an extension of his will and his desires. And yeah, it's creepy. And it made me very glad when she killed him. Yeah. And just the way like he sends her on the mission with them, it's this intriguing, like almost this double thing of, well, it's you can look at it one way in that he's sending her maybe because he trusts her and sees her as this capable resource but also it seems like a threat Mm. because it's like well if you don't come back with what he needs you're gonna die too yeah and he knows that and he's looking at her with this expression like yeah this is what i'm doing to you and she's looking at him too with this like realization like oh okay you're doing this to me yeah i got the impression that when he saw that connection between kira and han he became very jealous yeah, and same. I think he wanted to throw them together to see what would happen, like as a test of her loyalty, because mm-hmm. yeah, he wanted her to be completely loyal to him. Um, see, so yeah, all that stuff was super interesting. Um, oh, I think there was something else I wanted to say about Kira. What was it? Damn it. <laughs> uh, um. Oh yeah, and and I, at this point, I also just want to say that how relieved I was that they didn't go in the direction of making Kira like a full-on moustache twirling villain because that was like my worst fear that it might turn out to be like an Elsa Schneider character from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where she seems Mm -hmm. all innocent and she's just a romantic love interest who needs to be rescued blah 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 and then at the end turns out she's a Nazi and she's very evil and (laughs) she only wants things for profit I think there's way more depth and complexity to that character and so yeah I was grateful for that yeah i agree i feel like it's so much more interesting this way and it's kind of how i feel about um kylo and ray's dynamic in the last jedi and people's various reactions and readings of that because you get this like what was it joanna robinson called him sexy emo honey pot <laughs> but that's not that the depth comes from the fact that his feelings are real yeah and he's being used in this wider plot and you get that, that same thing with kira where she she really does feel something for Han. It's not that that's fake. She's not seducing and tricking him. Yeah. It's just that she's beholden to the larger things and that's where the tragic component comes from. Yeah. And I think, as you mentioned previously, I think a lot of her actions throughout the film, they're all about trying to protect him. I think she mm-hmm. intentionally withholds information about what's happened with her to protect him both to let him keep on thinking that she is what he imagines her to be and to avoid him getting caught up in any of the bad shit that she's presumably had to do and been involved in so i think as well as the potential for her having been a sex worker i think there's also potential for her to have killed people like just mm-hmm. dark ugly shit basically yeah at this point in the story i don't, I don't know how old kira is and maybe it's uh, clearer and most wanted in terms of um her age compared to han mm. but it feels like at this point in the story she seems so much older than him yeah because she's really been through it and he hasn't in the same way he's obviously had struggles but he's still coded as kind of teenage yeah that's and true. naive and like love struck whereas she's like she just seems older the way she's dressed and her hair's done and everything 
um it just feels very different and they're already at this point where she feels older than him and needs to protect him in that way yeah because i think that han and kira are definitely actually meant to be the same age so any appearance that she seems older than him that i think is very much meant to be a mark of this rough stuff she's been through and how she's had Mm -hmm. all these terrible experiences that have forced her to grow up and project this sophistication and maturity um i i'll probably have greater insight after i finish reading most wanted um but yeah like she does come across as very young and relatively innocent in the parts of that book i've read so far which makes sense because she seems quite naive and like unscarred at the start of solo as well it's only later on that you get that darker impression Mm -hmm. oh it's so sad like the bit where she's like oh i i always think of you and smile yeah and like you said there's this like element of this horrible contradiction where she wants to warn him that i'm not the girl you think i am or the girl i was but also likes the idea that he's still holding on to that idealized version of her because then in a way that version of her still exists yeah. and there's like this parallel universe where she could have been that person yeah oh so tragic it really really is it's why we need a happy ending to a love story for once in star wars Kirsty. yeah <laughs> i really enjoy it though like i do love these tragic romances of like things that could have been and then you still see them kissing they still have this connection yeah. but it can't work out for so many reasons definitely it is really well done um the angst oh so good um right (laughs) so god we've spoken so much about kira there's a lot to talk about though (laughs) which is she's really great she is i i'm really happy yeah i think she's right up there with ray for me to be honest like with my like favorite new characters from the like disney era star wars movies and certainly among the female characters in the disney era star wars movies like i really love her there's such a complexity to her that I wasn't quite anticipating because we'd heard that she was like femme fatale and all that, but I don't think that even covers it. No, not at all. That's a very reductive way of putting it, I think. Yeah, at least not if it's done well. Obviously, she has that component to her, but it's still, there's more going on. It's not like she's there trying to seduce him or yeah. trick everyone. It's that she's this real fleshed out person. And I there's, I always feel like things could be done better. And I do still feel like it's quite evident that this film was written by men. Yeah. I feel like you, you can tell that in terms of exactly how the female characters come across and how they're used in the, the men's arcs. Yeah. But I'm, I'm still attached to her. I still think they did a good job with her. And I think Amelia gave a great performance. Definitely. Right. So then Kira takes Han off to meet Lando. And we are introduced to him and Elfrey, who is his droid companion. What did we make of those two characters and how they're introduced? Uh, I loved the introduction, I thought. I knew that Donald Glover was going to be great, but it was really great. Yeah, <laughs> I keep using great as a word, I'm sorry. It just... Uh, yeah, he really pulled it off. He was and so good. Like I said at the beginning. Yeah, like, it. he just did such a fantastic job of like emulating that quality that billy d brought to the role but not too much yes it, it, it didn't just feel like an impression it felt like he added to it yeah and there were so many endearing moments of where even just Orlando by himself or just like throwaway references to him talking about his mother or that amazing moment where you see him talking into the hologram as if he has his own little youtube youtube channel or blog or something oh that was my was favorite like, lando moment <laughs> so good it's like that is lando yeah that was just brilliant (laughs) like that made me want a whole audiobook about lando narrated by donald glover (laughs) that would be just be magnificent yes Yes, please and it would have to be a book that's written in the first person nothing else would do (laughs) (laughs) maybe we'll get that we you know we have race to the glide we have rose's diary we could get a lando diary yeah like what would be the title of his book like lando's guy to the best hangouts in the galaxy (laughs) (laughs) that's probably a much too tame title for (laughs) yeah it's gonna be something vaguely scandalous yes it would be (laughs) so i'm much too square for that (laughs) (laughs) but yeah no he was fabulous and i also liked that he obviously cheats at the sabat game at the beginning Mm -hmm. but he's just so like lovable like you don't hate him for cheating you know, you're just like, oh, you oh, fun no. rogue. Oh, I love it. 
Exactly. Like even when you see it later with Han, you know it's come full circle, and you know that Han's gonna. You know he's he saw it. He knows what he's gonna do. He turns it on him. Yes. Um, I felt like that was handled well. That you see it from the beginning, and then you see it from the end, and how Han coming into Lando's life has kind of wrecked it in various ways. <laughs> yeah, and I really do like how the way the relationships handled in this movie. It does make perfect sense of how they're reintroduced to each other in Empire Strikes Back. You know, how, like, Lando grabs him and, like, claps him on the back and he's like... (laughs) And there's that strange tension between he's really angry with him, but he also loves him and he's a dear friend. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are going to be more meetings between them now, like, if we get sequels, or if this is it until Empire for them. What do you think? I think there's plenty of potential for them for there to be more meetings between this and Empire, because I'm sure mm-hmm. there's lots of other hijinks that go on that mean there's back cr- backstabbing and trouble and stuff that pisses each other off. Um, but at the same time, I think it would also be natural if this were it. Yeah, I feel like it could go both ways because they've set up that kind of frenemy dynamic and left it on that tone where it could just be, yeah, the next time they see each other it is Empire. Or you can develop that further and then with Empire you just get this reading of them being people who've known each other for years, came across each other various times, and then had this like ongoing exchange. Yeah. Where they've won and lost to each other and have this respect for each other, but are also just at each other's throats all the time. Yes. No, it's really neat. Prime shipping material. Oh, yeah. If there isn't a resurgence of Han Lando um, shipping after this, it will be criminal. Yeah. I mean, we knew that there was, like, some baiting going on with the whole L3 calling them out for the flirting. (laughs) Yes. But, yeah. It's... There is some subtext there, I feel like. Yeah. A little. There's definitely enough for a ship. Like, ships (laughs) run on less fuel than that. Um, Oh, sure. Yeah. get ships between people who've never even met. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> so what did we make of L3? I really liked her. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to work out if my bias of having read Last Shot is colouring that. And I feel like it is a little bit because I already knew I was going to be attached to her because of the amazing stuff she does in that book. Yes. Um, and I'm just sad that we lost her. Like I, I get it to an extent. Like you said earlier, the whole droid rights thing is obviously a core component of how she comes across in this movie and that felt a little played out by the time she is gone. Yes. Um, but I just, I liked her a lot and I wanted her to stick around a little longer. Yeah. Because we got a really great scene between her and Kira, but I was like, okay, it would be cool to see them talking about something else besides men and sex. Yeah, that's true. Like, I really liked that for what it was. Uh, I know some people have taken issue with it, And I understand why, because it is the main interaction we get between them. And we should have just had more, but we didn't. Um, I thought it was very funny, and I think that Phoebe did a fantastic performance. Yes. But it's just always like, I'm greedy, I want more. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Like, I think for me, the highlight is when she's in the control station on Kessel. And, like, there's the droid, like, and it's at a loss what to do. And she's like, oh, I don't know, go free your brothers and sisters or something. (laughs) I love that. The delivery was fantastic. So yeah, I really like the character. Like, I don't feel like she was underused. Like, in the way that I felt that with Val. You know, I definitely felt that Val was underused. Whereas I was kind of like, yeah, I feel like I've got enough of this character. Just for me personally. Um, But I really did enjoy when she was on screen. And I found her really funny. (laughs) Yeah, and I really bought in a quick space of time. Again, this might be because of the last shot, so I don't know. But um, just her and Lando's connection. Yes. That they had this real affection for each other, even though they both annoyed each other. (laughs) Yes. Um, And obviously, like, to some extent, yeah, they're poking fun at the idea of them having sex. Like, that's played for laughs, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, it works. Uh (laughs) And uh, yeah, I will continue to side-eye the idea that that makes Lando pansexual because, come on now. (laughs) This droid identifies as female. Like, no, sorry. (laughs) Oh my goodness, I've seen so many stupid, stupid conversations about pansexual in the light of, like, Jake Kasdan's comments. 
I was like, J- look, well, you shouldn't have even said it. It's just no. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of insulting because she's obviously coded as a human cis woman. It's not like, it's just, yes, technically she's a droid within the story, but that's not what pansexual means. <laughs> Uh. sorry (laughs) it's just really silly it's like i get what you're trying to do you're trying to get yourself some progression points but that's not what this is it's very silly Um, yeah right Uh, (laughs) so and yet like obviously it's it's really sad when she dies because lando's cradling her like he loves her yes i was listening to slash film podcast this morning and (laughs) this made me laugh they were talking about how putting her in the Falcon without her consent reminded them of that Black Mirror episode where you like have this digital self that's like imprisoned and is a slave. Oh wow! And I was just like, I don't think you're supposed to think about it that way. They were like, none of the characters voice any concern. Lando's totally fine with it. This woman he loves being put in the Falcon forever and like being forced to run things. It's like, yeah, the fact that there is no character who raises issue with that probably means that that's not what you're supposed to take away from the story. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird reading. Um, Like, it kind of vaguely <laughs> reminded me of The Doctor's Wife, an episode of Doctor Who. Can you remember that episode? Yes! That's what it reminded me of, the TARDIS. Yeah. The, the TARDIS has this female personality, and then because of that has this dynamic with the Doctor. Like, it's sentient, and yeah. it's supposed to be humorous, and fantastical it's not sinister <laughs> yeah i think for me the only reason why that kind of fell a bit flat for me with like l3 being put into the falcon is that that did really feel like retrofitting because you never get any concept of like there being this robot consciousness like ruling the falcon like it does have a bit of personality don't get me wrong but yeah like i'm not sure how natural the fit was for that if that makes isn't sense. there a moment in empire when 3PO is talking about the personality of the Falcon? Maybe. Like, I, I'm very rubbish at remembering dialogue, so I won't say yes or no definitively, but there could well have been. Okay, let me find it. There's a... Yeah, so there's a line in Empire. He says, Sir, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate, but it has the most peculiar dialect. Oh, wow. Okay, I take it back. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just this little nod. So I have this tweet here. Apparently it was um, Amy Ratcliffe and Nerdist who pointed this out. Um, but then I was going back over the Last Jedi novelization, and there's that bit from R2's point of view mm-hmm. with the Falcon. Yes. And he's talking about the Falcon's various droid personalities and how it's kind of reluctant and sulky to cooperate with him. Oh, wow. That's so cool. I really like that. That's a nice example of synergy working obviously it's very subtle like it is the kind of this throwaway line from c3po in empire but it's kind of cool that they can go back and add layers of meaning to those things definitely because i mean even in the past i feel like it's been it's kind of the way people relate to their cars when they really love them right that han feels like the falcon has this personality Mm. that like not just anyone can fly her she's referred to as a her like many cars are yes and it's just like, yeah, there's this relationship. Yeah. Um, but obviously now it's a little bit more explicit as to why that could be. Yeah, that is really cool. I definitely appreciate that now. So I'm glad you explained that to me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, it, again, it's like some of these things that could easily be missed. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like the beauty of Star Wars. I feel like there are all these little layers and little tidbits. Definitely. So yeah, we kind of got a bit of ahead of ourselves in the discussions about Elfrey's death because that happens after they get to Kessel and mm. there's a bit of an escapade where they free all the slaves and Chewie actually encounters a bunch of other Wookiees which is interesting yeah I remember when we all thought that was going to be his wife or daughter, uh, son yes uh, like <laughs> what did you say it was I know I said it was Marla which is obviously I wrong. thought it was Lumpy <laughs> Damn because it. because <laughs> I thought that because, and I guess this is why you thought it was his wife, because it kind of looked kind of smaller and scrawny, and I just thought it looked more like a son. Mm. Um, but they're Wookiees, yeah. so <laughs> it could be anyone. <laughs> and it just turned out it was a Wookiee who was down on his luck and had obviously lot, not lived a good, healthy life. Like, he was presumably malnourished, and yeah. his hair was not looking 
up to scratch. Just needed knows. some nurturing. Yeah. <laughs> did did you were you slightly perturbed by that Wookiee or like the robbery mask? Kind of I was like I yeah, it looked a bit like a Halloween mask version of a Wookiee. A little. Yeah. A little hokey. Yeah. That didn't truly work for me, but I did like that Chewie had his own all side adventure to help the Wookiees go free. Because it's nice yeah, me to give him a bit of autonomy and to show him operating independent of Han. Because often it is more of like a boy and his dog thing. But like Chewie just follows Han around, does whatever Han says. But I like that in this movie, especially at this stage in their relationship, it felt completely natural that they would still be quite independent operators. But it also was a good showcase for their friendship. Because it showed that Han is a good friend by just being totally supportive of that and cool with it. Like, he wasn't like, no, you get back here. You, you're you working for me. <laughs> it's like, right. yeah, you go and do you. And hopefully see you later. And that was charming and nice. Yeah, I felt like this was going to be the Chewbacca movie. And I, I, it kind of was. Because I feel like, like you say, it really did lend... It, it made it clear that he was his own person... Yes. Um, and yeah, they met and he was in prison at the time and Han worked with him. They they worked together to get out of there. But also Han was like, yeah, we've got to do this one job together and then you're free to go off and do what you want to do and I'm going to do what I need to do. Obviously, we know it doesn't work out that way and they stick together. Yeah. But at that point, it was like, yeah, we're going to be friends while we're doing this stuff, but very much on equal footing. Yeah, exactly. Which was really nice. And I think it's also important because, like, basically they go through this whole pretense of Kira is this, like, assistant to this regional overlord. And then Han and Chewie are, like, captured slaves to be sold. And they use some very, like, charged imagery of, like, Han and Chewie having their mouths checked for teeth and that sort of thing. So there's obviously all these, (laughs) like, evocations of real-life slavery. And, yeah, it would have been a bit... uh, If they had showed like the relationship between Han and Chewie has been too unequal. And I think there's always a danger of that if it's not handled well. Mm -hmm. And we even got them showering together. (laughs) Yes. Now that should be a ship. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it is. Oh, Lord. (laughs) I I also just want to say on a superficial level how magnificent Kira looked in that disguise. It was so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and also from... Uh, most wanted. Kira has a passion for fashion. She really likes. I figured. <laughs> so. Yeah, just seeing her in Lando's closet. Yeah, that was yeah really great. And then she just finds one of the capes and wears it, and just looks amazing. Yeah, it totally kills it. And then what did we think about the Kessel Run, like the famous Kessel Run, and how that was executed? Did you feel that was more successfully done than say the train heist? Yes, I did. I wasn't like super invested in seeing the Kessel Run. Mm. I know that it it has felt in some ways like they had this list of things that they wanted to yeah, give fans. Definitely. That but was one of my I issues. felt like it was executed well. Yeah, no, like, I, I agree. I felt engaged and I felt the tension. I thought it was pretty cool the way that they would, you know, with the whole Beckett and um, giving them that bump with the fuel. Yes. And I also liked how the capstone to it was just a conversation on a uh, Savarine. Like, where it's like, yeah, I just did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. And he's, like, so <laughs> yeah, puffed up and cute. proud of himself. <laughs> it was quite adorable. He's still super proud of that years later as well. It was so cute because it was like, oh, God, this is the, the thing that he, like, brags about for years now. Yeah. It's kind of that situation where, like, your dad is always, like, telling stories about his youth. And he'll have this, like, mm. one story that he'll go back to again and again and again. And you know that was Han's story in the Solo household. So I'm sure that mm-hmm. by the time Ben Solo was 15, he was like, Dad, I've heard it a million times! <laughs> <laughs> That's what turned him to the dark side. <laughs> oh, <Aww>. Sad. <laughs> oh, dear. Boo. But yeah, no, I thought it was a pretty well done action scene. And I really liked how they used the fuel to turbocharge the Falcon. Uh-huh. That was really well done. Um, because especially because they do the whole fake out where at first they make it look like it didn't work and then it literally like supercharges and it's really good. Especially with the whole parallel to the very early scene where he's trying to get through the narrow gap and he fails and then how he tries it the same trick with the Kessel Run and that time it works. Yeah, that was a cute exchange with him and Kira. He was like, remember that? And she's like, yeah, but it didn't work. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was so hard. Yeah. No, that was adorable and high, hugely appreciated. And I think there's also that theme in the movie where you see characters try things the first time, they don't work, but then they come mm-hmm. back to them with a fresh perspective and they try doing it a little differently, then it works. Mm-hmm. So you see that in at least two, two cases with that whole narrow escape thing and then the Sabak game. Yeah. And, you know, because it's Lucasfilm, of course, we had to have a tentacle monster. Oh, God. Like, is that someone's fetish? It's like Yes, that's got to be. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> <But> why? <laughs> Presumably it's several people's at Lucasfilm's fetish yeah. because it pops up everywhere. It's in the animation, it's in the live action, it's in the books. It's super weird. <laughs> Still, I'm no one to judge, so you do you guys. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> Right. So then they all get to Savarine and there is a fresh encounter with Envis Nest where she removes her mask to reveal a young teenage girl, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. And also the rest of her gang. They also all reveal their true faces, including Warwick Davis. And I think I read he's playing the same character he played in The Phantom Menace, which is really cool. I read that as well. Like I, I hadn't realised that during. It didn't cross my mind because it's like, oh yeah, there's Warwick Davis. He's in all the Star Wars films. Yeah, it's like, yo! But yeah. <laughs> but that was really cool. Yeah, no, it is really cool. And it also has interesting story implications. It must mean that Tatooine was also being menaced by these like gangs and syndicates because that's mm-hmm. Envis Nest's whole spiel that the reason all these people have come together is because they're just fed up with the exploitation and the tyranny that's just being allowed to go unchecked while the empire is in operation because of course the ultimate reveal is that they're aligned with the rebellion and yeah i really like that and it's an interesting nod i think to some of the other sources because you do get things in rebels don't you like the whole mandos like supporting the rebellion even though they're still very much their own thing and they have their own identity within that conflict would you say that's true exactly Yeah, that you have all of these people with their own interests across the galaxy unified by the fact that the Empire is oppressing them. Um, And then I I felt like that's what came through in Rogue One as well, that you have this alliance, but people were very fragmented in their own specific views and strategies. Yes. It feels true to life, right? Like you have this ominous force oppressing people in all these different ways. People will be trying to find out or how it can benefit them and their people to take specific actions and whether they're going to care about what's happening to people they perceive as other. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it was super interesting. And it was obviously a small role, but as we've both established, we really liked Enfys. And mm-hmm. I think the actress did a really good job. She was very like earnest and sincere and just lovely you know she's a nice person but she was also a complete badass it was Mm -hmm. really nice she like spanned a whole spectrum yeah i was so happy with that reveal and i want more of emphasis nest yeah (laughs) where it's in book form where she pops up in another movie but yeah like you i thought the actress did a great job i actually recognized her Mm -hmm. Uh, she hasn't been in much stuff but i recognized her from this sitcom based on Catelyn moran's life um if people don't know her she's this british journalist um, she writes a lot about feminism and um, her sitcom is called Raised by Wolves. I think it's been cancelled, but um, she played Cousin Kathy. Ah, cool. And uh, yeah, she just stuck in my mind. So I recognised her face as soon as she took the mask off. I was like, oh, cool. It's not someone that's famous. And that makes sense because we hadn't heard the casting news. Yeah. Um, but I think that was a, I think that was a good choice to go with someone who was unfamiliar to people. Yeah, definitely. It's like, hey, it's Cousin Kathy. <laughs> I'm probably one of a handful of people who thought that when the mask came off. But yeah, if other Catelyn Moran fans are out there, <laughs> you're a legion. Yeah, no. So I thought she was a really striking, like actress, like very pretty, but also very like distinctive and unique looking. Mm-hmm. Okay, so on a scale of one to ten, how satisfying was it to see Dryden get murdered? It was very satisfying and I'm very glad that Kira got to do it. Yes, yeah, same. I was really worried they might give it to Han. And I was like, no, because that's not really a personal thing between Han and Dryden. They barely know each other. Like the only thing they have going on is their like entanglement with Kira. 
and the fact that Dryden's quite jealous. Like Han seems kind of oblivious, to be honest, to <laughs> whatever's going on. Um, but yeah, I don't think that would have been enough to justify Han doing it. And I also really liked that Kira was able to turn the skills Dryden had given her against him. Because she mentions earlier in the movie that Dryden had taught her this specific fighting style. And at the end, that's what she uses to defeat him. And it was really cool. Yeah, I agree. I think if Han had been the one to do it, it would have had very different implications for the story. It would have been this much more classic, I am the hero rescuing the princess kind of thing. Exactly. Um, And that just isn't their dynamic. Kira can rescue herself and she's been living in this prison and she doesn't rescue herself entirely because we just don't see her escape that life. Yeah. Um, But I think that's more compelling. Yeah, definitely. Um, So, yeah, it makes you want to see what's next for her. Yeah. That to me is easily the most compelling part. Yeah. I'm I'm sure some people consider this a weakness of the movie um, because kind of when they started out making these films they said that they were going to be standalones I just don't believe that I feel like they invest in finding these right cast members and they build this aspect of the universe I don't think it's going to be a one and done kind of thing Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure that depends on how successful the movie is Yes. but um, I feel like it's set up here that they can go in a number of different ways with the characters and focus on different things. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I feel like it's set up that we're going to get more from Kira, whether that is in a movie or a book. Yeah. Like, even if there isn't a sequel movie to this, I would absolutely buy a novel exploring what happens next with this character because I'm very intrigued by her and I want to know more. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Okay, and then we move into the final stretch of the movie uh, where we get a whole bunch of stuff happening. Um, We get Han killing Beckett, Han refusing to join Enfys when she invites him to put his skills and his good, good heart towards the rebellion. Kira contacting Maul and (laughs) Han winning the Falcon in Sabacc. There's lots of juicy stuff here, so I'm going to get the less juicy stuff out of the way first. So what did you make of that scene where like Han confronts Beckett for the final time because Beckett of course he's revealed to be a traitor he turns Han into Dryden and that's what initiates the whole fight that ends up getting Dryden killed um but yeah like I think overall I really liked what Woody Harrelson did with the character I do think it was quite predictable that he was going to be the one to betray Han because he's literally the guy who says trust no one (laughs) (laughs) yeah and he's like I told you I told you so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, that's kind of like a played out trope at this point. But I still think they did a good job of it. Yeah, and I liked that when it happened and Han did kill him, he was basically like, yeah, respect. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I can't judge you for this because that's exactly what I would have done. <laughs> Peace out, yeah. brother. I do think it's interesting that we see Han killing a mentor father figure. That's true. Ooh, like father, like son. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah, whether you're going to look at that from like Kylo killing Han or killing Snoke, mm. there there is a theme here of that kind of usurping because you can make a case for Han then fitting into Beckett's role the way that Kira fits into Voss's role Yeah. by the end. They've overturned those mentor figures. Yeah, no, that's very true. Like Beckett even talks about having a job on Tatooine to go and pick up. And the implication of the movie is that that's where Han goes instead. Mm-hmm. So he's literally yeah, taken on Jabba, right? role. Yeah, exactly, yeah. one would assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty well done, even if it's a little predictable, like you say. Yeah, definitely. I appreciated it. And I, I really loved that last exchange between um, Han and Emphis. Yes. Just that she was like, come on, we need people like you. And he's like, no, I, I'm not for me. Because it's like, yeah, we know where all that ends up, that eventually he decides that it is for him, but it's not where he is right now in his character arc. Yeah, no, exactly. And there's a nice little dose of irony there as well. Mm -hmm. So we very much appreciated that. And yeah, so now we get to the famous Maul cameo. Um, Like, I really don't like this. This is one of the aspects (laughs) of the movie I like the least. Um, and just to be clear that I'm not like just blindly hating this 
like it's like first of all just because it feels like so random it feels like it just comes completely out of the blue which is obviously the point it's meant to shock you is meant to represent a real like twist and a surprise and I, I totally get that and it does have that effect but I, I kind of feel like the execution was quite hokey like he looked super weird the voice felt a bit off to me and most of all the fact that he ignites his lightsaber <laughs> in a completely <laughs> superfluous move it just makes absolutely no sense and it was just complete pandering it was just so transparent to me that yeah that just turned me off and i was just laughing at it to be honest i was laughing too it's, this is interesting because we disagree in terms of how we feel about it but also not because i totally get what you're saying and i kind of agree it just it doesn't bother me i think it's funny <laughs> maybe it's not meant to be maybe i'm taking it the wrong way and i'm meant to be like oh really scared because darth maul's back <laughs> but it just seems like peak pulpy star wars for me and i have to love it for that reason like yeah it's corny as hell it's really silly because the general audience presumably is kind of confused about the timeline now and thinking wait didn't we see him cut in half in phantom menace but I love it for all those reasons. I, I've seen people literally saying, like, oh, so does that mean this movie takes place before Phantom Menace? No, oh, it's like, God. oh, no, people are so confused. Well, I do wonder if it's a somewhat cynical attempt by the story group to try and get people into the animation that already exists. <laughs> like, oh, well, you know, you should check out The Clone Wars because you'll see Darth Maul with spider legs. <laughs> Well, it's certainly going to put that on the radar of lots of people who would have otherwise had no idea. So, mission accomplished. I've just got to say, unless an interview comes out that like objectively proves me wrong, I will never accept that this was Lawrence or John Carson's idea. <laughs> this no. is this is a story group idea. There is no way in hell those guys looked at the prequels and were like, you know who we should bring back for the twist at the end of this movie? Yeah. I think maybe like in the script it's something like a shadow shadowy figure speaks with Kira. It's like, oh, we should make it more. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah, because you cannot even picture this like conversation with Lawrence Kasdan and Pablo Hidalgo where Lawrence is like, okay, so who's the guy we could use for this? Or like, should we keep him mysterious and whatever? And Pablo's like, well, you know, Darth Maul survived. <laughs> because... <laughs> He wouldn't bring him up himself, surely. No, it's dumb. This is the Darth Vegas guy. <laughs> yeah, I can just picture him saying, Darth Small? <laughs> 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 Who's that? <laughs> yeah, so I I agree with you. I totally see where you're coming from, but I also like it. Yeah. Because I think it's just so out there such an f you to people who were like disney hate the prequels yeah like they don't no they're making these deliberate attempts to unify the canon to bring all these elements in to bridge these gaps between the trilogies and it makes me wonder what we're gonna see in nine yeah could we get a padme reference wow please that's what i want please <laughs> even if only so, yeah, like a painting service, but... in the background come on exactly like just some yeah we have the vader references we know carlo wants to be vader but what about padme what about grandma he wants to be padme secretly who doesn't <laughs> he wants to have fabulous clothes oh, this is what we get hair. yeah exactly we get supreme leader ben solo with padme's influence on his wardrobe oh my perfect God. yes and like we there could be like a whole extended scene in kylo's closet where he's like picking out clothes and there could be a lovely big portrait of Padme Amidala on the wall. Yeah, and, I want it. And there could be like a completely meta moment where he like looks at it and he's like, thank you, Grandma. <laughs> and then he cries <laughs> because we know that we love Kylo the most when he's crying. Exactly. So yeah, it was fan service. It was ridiculous. But I love that element of Star Wars sometimes. Yes. Um, And... I am so intrigued by Kira and Maul, and that is my crack ship coming out of Solo. Whoa, bold statement. Because because it sets it up, right? It's like, come to me on Daphomir. <laughs> oh my god, we heard Daphomir <laughs> in a Star Wars movie, for one. Now I'm picturing Kira with the Night Sisters. With I just, I'm so intrigued. 
Like, how are we going to get that aspect of the story? Are, are they going to bring that in in terms of animation? Is it going to be resigned to a book? I would still read it. I would love it. Is it going to be a premise for a future movie? Yeah. Like, they're setting that up there. It's like, what the hell are they going to do together? What is Darth Maul's plan here? I think if Solo is a success, they would definitely be more movies to touch upon all of this stuff. But even if it isn't, I do think we'll see the story continued or just be in comics or books or something. Yeah. I don't know. It just it interests me. And I I had been spoiled on Darth Maul. I knew he was going to be in it. Mm. And I, I'd gone in kind of thinking it was going to be like a Ponda Barba and um, Rogue One cameo. Right. Which I did. And I was like, oh, that's going to be garbage. So they're just going to like bump into him in a crowd and it's going to be Darth Maul with a hood up so you can't see him exactly, but you know who he is. But this surprised me because I was like, oh, he's actually part of the story. Yeah, it was super bold. It definitely wasn't like a throwaway fan service thing. It's like that was a bit the case with like Aura Singh because like Beckett just brings up having killed Aura Singh or someone else does to Beckett and is like, yeah, you're just throwing it in there for the fans. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did like that because it was the kind of thing where um, if an audience member doesn't know who Aura Singh is, it's just another line of dialogue. Yeah, right. No, it's that's just true. something that establishes Becca as this dangerous individual who's killed people. Yes. Um, but for people who do know that, it's like, oh, cool. Presumably, we'll get that story at some point. Yeah. Or maybe not. But still, it's like a nice throw throw out um, nod to Aura Singh. Yeah. So no, no, that's true. You're right. I'm probably being a bit too harsh on that in particular. So it does serve dual purposes. I mean. I totally get it. Like, I do feel like there were a million references to things in this movie compared to what we got in The Last Jedi, but this is what I anticipated because I felt like Lucasfilm knew that they were going to have to win back a little more favour with fans who felt disappointed by The Last Jedi because it broke too much new ground. Yes. Um, so this is just kind of an easy way to score more brownie points. So maybe it's cynical, but I don't mind so much. Yeah. No, no, I see where you're coming from. And I, I, yeah, coming back to it again with Kira and Han, I just, I really liked the way that went down, that she was protecting him by talking to Maul and being like, yeah, I'm going to go and do this. And she looked scared. Yeah. But that was her making a sacrifice for, I mean, again, this stuff is all up for debate and I've seen various takes on Kira and what she does at the end. Mm. And I'm sure some people are like, that bitch, she betrayed Han, she screwed him over, she didn't go with him or whatever. But my reading is that she was protecting him. Yeah. making a choice that she didn't want to make yeah um and that she cared for him much very much but um he doesn't even know what's gone down by the end of the movie he's just he hasn't been named maul doesn't know about him yeah no he's kind of oblivious isn't he really yeah yeah and i absolutely think kira did that as like a selfless act of love to be honest because she must have known rationally that if she had run off with han then everyone would know that it was her and Han Solo that they were looking for because Maul would presumably have people to send after them and they would have both been right. dead. So it was really the only choice she could have made. Exactly. So, yeah, I like that. Yeah, same. <laughs> In the end. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, and yeah, then the movie ends on a very jolly and happy note with Han finally winning at Sabacc by turning Lando's own trick against him. He basically steals the sabat card that lando li literally had up his sleeve <laughs> and yeah he owns him and he wins the falcon and it's delightful yeah i just loved that because it went down that it was like this double bind where han made sure that lando knew that he'd been cheating and lando knew that han had done this like in this not coach away yes but it didn't matter because they were kind of playing by their own rules at that point right and that lando knew that han deserved it yeah um in this very begrudging way um i just thought that was executed so well and it was a really great way to um cap things off in this light-hearted manner yes. compared to what all of that heavy emotion and betrayal and action had been going on before yeah so it was like this it's lovely epilogue. Exactly. And it also felt like it made the movie complete because as we've discussed, there's definitely lots of avenues they could take if they did want to make another solo movie. But I think because it ends on that note with Han getting the Falcon and flying off into hyperspace, it does feel nicely rounded out. So I felt mm -hmm. I felt satisfied. 
I just love that when we got the trailer and we were all looking at the Falcon, like, oh my God, it's brand new, it's white, it has this lovely upholstery. And then Han just trashes it in like one trip. He just gets on it and destroys it. And Lando's like, oh, thanks. I never want to see you again. Oh God, it's so funny. <laughs> Especially because Han is so cheerful about doing it. Like he doesn't yeah. like have any anxiety or self-awareness over it at all. It's just a thing he does. <laughs> I would have taken almost the opposite approach to Han with this like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. I'm going to try and keep it in as pristine condition as I can. Same. But because he's almost used to things looking trashy, he's like, no, this needs to be rougher around the edges. <laughs> oh, it show is interesting. It shows how he deals with his past like that plucky way. Yeah. Oh, bless him. Our <laughs> favourite ne'er-do-well. Oh, and we need to mention the dice as well because the dice are like oh, a yes, running motif across the whole movie. Like that, there's a nice Last Jedi tie-in going on, of course. Um, and yeah, it's really delightful um, how they're used because I think it does attach more significance to the dice in particular and also how they're used in The Last Jedi because they're kind of used very much like as a marker of like love in Solo, I think. So there's lots of passing of the dice between Han and Kira back and forth. And I think that Han like pushes the dice into Kira's hand as they're being separated at the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And then Kira gives Han the dice back, like without him initially realizing what she's done when he's like under, like he's being taken prisoner as a slave on Kessel. And yeah, it's this, this silent motif that's used to communicate how they feel about each other and how strong those feelings are. And yeah, I really Mm -hmm. liked it. Yeah, and I feel like we've talked before about how well we felt those were used as a prop in The Last Jedi. And we know from things like the novelization and the Star Wars databank that they were a favourite toy of Ben Solo when he was a baby. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So yeah, they are the symbol of Han's love for all these various people that come in and out of his life. Yeah. Um, And yeah, we know now that they were cut out of a scene in The Force Awakens and I'm kind of bummed that we lost that. Um, but I still feel like it, it came through well in The Last Jedi. It was it was clear what they were trying to do with them. Yes. And um, I feel like it's very poetic that they disappear in Kylo's hands at the end, and it's interesting to think about whether we'll see them again in Nine. Yeah, exactly. They could make a startling reappearance for all we know. Although I guess in reality, as we're, like with where things end in The Last Jedi, the dice would physically be on Act 2, wouldn't they? Because Luke got them down from the Falcon and kept them and the dice that are on crate at the end they're only ever force projected they're never really there oh did he like put them in his pocket on octo or something like that something like that yeah so oh okay i thought he might have left them on the falcon so that they were still physically there maybe like it's very unclear like they could be but i did think he took them away with him okay I guess it depends what JJ wants to do ultimately. If he wants to carry on with that or drop it, he could yeah. probably make it work either way. Exactly. They could do a whole mission just to pick up the dice for a random reason. <laughs> 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 That'd be the Jabba's oh. Palace scene from Return of the Jedi in the sequel trilogy. <laughs> just lame. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> we need to rescue the dice. <laughs> but why? <laughs> just because. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> they mean a lot to our family. <laughs> they represent oh, love, yeah. okay? <laughs> <laughs> right, so I think that brings us to the end of our solo review. We hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I really enjoyed talking about the movie, actually. And talking through it actually made me appreciate it even more. I've seen it twice already, but I'm tempted to go and see it again. So I know you definitely want to see it for a second time, don't you, Kirsty? And um, yeah, same. I feel like going over the stuff, even though I... I could see the stuff as I was watching it and I was like, okay, I've got to come back to that and think about it a bit more. Just kind of going through the chronology of the movie and the development of all the characters and everything, it does cement it as more than just this shallow popcorn movie that I think I've seen it banded about as. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's obviously that too. It's very entertaining. It's got a lot of humour and like, you know, the blatant romance of it. Like all of that stuff is very, yes, entertaining i like it but there's more there too yeah. um and i feel like it's a welcome addition to the star wars canon i i don't feel like it like sticks out like a sore thumb or is 
I don't know, completely unnecessary, like some people think. Yes. Um, because all films are unnecessary. Yeah. If you enjoy them and you find something in them that makes you happy and gives you something to think about, that's what matters. So Exactly. And people like need to be confident in what they enjoy, you know? Like yeah. I love Jupiter Ascending. That film was critically mauled and absolutely <laughs> crashed at the box office. Like, but you can't let that affect your enjoyment of something, you know? So yeah. like no one should care about any like outside influences like critic reviews or box office. If you like the movie, awesome. If you didn't like the movie, also fine. And if you like the movie with reservations, great. You know, like everything is fine. Just it's all about relaxing and just accepting that people will feel differently from you. Exactly. We're going to get a new Star Wars movie every year now. And I feel like even though people know that, I I think it's going to take the fandom a while to stop thinking of these as sacred. Yes. Um, because not everything is going to blow your mind and rock your world. And you might not like something. You might hate something. Yeah. It's okay because you're going to have something else yeah. just a few months later. Exactly. It's not the end of the line, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I love this movie. I enjoyed it. It's not my favourite that's okay yeah <laughs> exactly and i think that's a nice note to end things on so i am rachel you can find me at stars nonsense on tumblr and at journal of the stars on wordpress where can people find you kirsty i'm bastila bay on tumblr kirsty of jakku on twitter and you can find us at scavengers horde on twitter as well thank you so much for listening and until next time bye bye